Next question. Well, I'm, I'm Deborah Waroff. Just to follow up a bit on Hillary's question and also what you just mentioned about the CFS initiative, which will do uh, flora. Um, I'm just wondering if there's some place where one can't get in and uh, you've gone to so much work uh, compiling great cohorts, both for the CFS initiative and for this project. And with HIV, a good deal of work was done with lymph uh, glands and so forth. And I just think it would be very tempting since you could aspirate fairly readily to go back and do the lymph for all these people. And in a way, I'm a little surprised, although I'm not used to the confines of scientific method, that you could resist the temptation to extract a bit of lymph as you were going along. But since that was used in HIV, I just wonder if that wouldn't be a very tempting target. Well, doing lymph node dissections is far more invasive than phlebotomy. And once again, the objective here was to follow up on studies that were based on analysis of blood. And the findings in those studies were so robust that when we used I think it was, was it maybe, was it three times as many subjects as we thought we needed to confirm the results in that study? We felt that we were powering it sufficiently that we could thoroughly and adequately and rigorously test the validity of those first findings. Again, this is what I do for a living. I, we, we discover viruses. So we frequently use tissue samples and other samples and so forth. But the point of this study was to test the original findings. Going forward, should there be opportunities to examine tissues, not necessarily for XMRV or PMLV, but other agents, then um, we would, of course, entertain joining that sort of a search. But that's not what was proposed here. That's not what we were supported to do. Uh, and I don't think it was germane to the first part of this particular topic. Now, there is an independent effort, as I say, under the Hutchins Family Foundation to support work in CFI, excuse me, in, called CFI and CFS research. Uh, whether that moves into analysis of tissues or not is not something to which I, I have insight. You haven't decided yet. Well, it's not me. I don't decide. Oh. I'm a scientist. I'm not the director of that initiative. Um, oh, it's the director who decides. The, the director does that in consultation with other investigators, but that's a decision that's made by them. But again, once you start moving into tissue biopsies, mm -hmm. it becomes a very different situation. Uh, you have much higher risk of infection, mm -hmm. bleeding. Uh, people are less likely to want to do this. Um, so it's going to be much more difficult. And any time you make it more difficult to get samples, mm -hmm you wind up with a bit of a selection bias. Mm. Who's going to volunteer for that particular arm of the study as opposed to simply a blood test or a collection of fecal material or urine or something like that? If I mm. could make just... Well, let me just oh, let uh, Dr. Alter step yeah. in for a moment. I, I think one has to resist the temptation to keep the murine retroviral hypothesis alive. Mm. Uh, what you're suggesting is to say, well, it, it all came out negative, but maybe it's still true by doing something else. And I think rather you have to say this study was really quite definitive uh, and has basically excluded these agents as the cause of CSF, uh, CFS. Uh, and yet is the impetus for moving on to more extensive, deeper studies to really find the, the actual cause. And, and I might just and follow up to what Harvey's just said. We, we don't necessarily think that there's a single cause. There may be many different viruses that act in concert. Let's say, for example, we're talking about encephalitis. There are many different viruses that can cause encephalitis, bacteria. There are chemical encephalitides. There are 
uh, cancer-associated encephalitis, and they're all encephalitis. This may be a syndrome that has many factors, and what we need to do is to understand the epidemiology, the pathogenesis of this disorder, and it may well be that we're going to move into some era of personalized medicine where some people will need treatment for one agent, some autoimmune process, some toxicological process, whatever is most appropriate. So we have an open mind, but what we've done is to try to collect the materials that would be needed to do this in a systematic fashion. Judy, you wanted to add something? Uh, yeah, exactly. I mean, we so rigorously excluded our initial findings that, that these agents, MLV, XMRV, is in blood, and, and of course a lot from the lymph system pours into the blood. We've looked at the plasma, we've looked at the serum by deep sequencing technologies, and, and our original work cultured it at length. It's, it's simply not there, um, but now is the time to use these valuable materials and, and move forward, um, and, and, and that's what science is all about. And, and that's what this opportunity was for the patient population and why I think it was so important that it was supported at the level it was by, by the NIH and, and these investigators. Yeah, if there had not been an XMRV and a PMLV story, I very much doubt that this syndrome would have the attention it now has. So in, in credit, really, to the investigators here, they put a spotlight on this. It's going to have an impact for decades to come. Can I just make a comment? Let me just follow up. See, Con, is there anything you'd like to bring in? Okay, I, let me, let me, I have to be fair in how I take these questions. So would you read it to me? Just one moment, please. Yes, yeah, so we have a question from the post. Uh, how is this study different from the, uh, the previous ones? What does it give the power to refute? Uh, how do you explain the initial positive reports? What went wrong there? Well, this is, there are actually several questions embedded there. So the first is, how is it different? The study is different because all the investigators who were originally engaged in the reports that either proposed these viruses or refuted the presence of these viruses, the key studies are represented in the study. So you have Frank Rochetti, Judy Mikovits, Harvey Alter, Shailene Lowe, Bill Switzer, all participated in this study. The decisions on how to define a patient as a, as a, as a case, that is a, a subject as a case was suitable for this project, was determined by the six leading clinical investigators in CFS research in the nation. The decision on how to pursue laboratory tests was made by the groups that had originally reported the findings. We did not force people to use our assays, our reagents, people allowed to do whatever they wanted. The only thing we insisted upon was that the analysis be blind and that once a decision was made as to how to call a case a case and to call it positive or negative, that that could not change. So that really is very difficult to do. It required an enormous amount of effort. Just the human subject's approval alone took us over six months to get through all of these hoops. If we had added lymph nodes, just to give you an example, we would still be in the process of trying to plan the study. So that's an example of the study design. Secondly, the study was overpowered. What do I mean by that? We didn't start with a small number of cases. We had close to 150 cases and close to 150 controls. We designed the study so that if there was a geographical bias, so that one agent was important in one part of the country but not in another, we would not be confounded. So we had six different catchment areas for collecting these subjects. The controls were collected in the same catchment area and within a few weeks of the time that the subject was identified. Why is that important? Because infectious agents move through communities and one month they may, it may be influenza that's moving through, the next month it may be strep throat. And you can be confused as to whether or not something is significant or not different. So we made certain that everything was close together, geographically, temporally, so we would have a very clean result that would be impossible to misinterpret. 
And we carried it through to completion and made certain that at the end of the day, everyone was in accord. In contrast with some of the earlier studies where people had some, and they, they were unhappy with the way the results were presented, they didn't actually stand up and say, I'm really behind the work that was done here. This group has said, we are firmly behind these findings. Again, this is an extraordinary thing. You know, perhaps as important as what you're seeing with this, with reflection, you know, with respect to chronic fatigue syndrome, syndrome and myalgic encephalomyelitis, is an example of science at its finest. This is, it doesn't get any better than this. You know, you put ideas up, you try to knock them down, and you move forward, and that's what everyone is saying here. So that's the way in which the study is different. Now, as to what went wrong the first time around, all I can do is say, as Judy has said and as Frank has said, and as Harvey has said, there was an error. There was a contamination. This happens. You know, this is not a perfect world. We do the best we can. And science is self-correcting. The important thing is that you do correct and you do move on. And again, as Judy said, the silver lining is that there's a tension now on this syndrome. There will be progress made. There are supplies, reagents, techniques, there are people who are working together who've never worked together before, so we will make progress. Our first foray, if you will want to call it that, into chronic fatigue syndrome was back in the middle 1990s when there was a Japanese group that said 50% of chronic fatigue syndrome in Japan was due to Borna disease virus, a virus that we'd identified um, several years earlier. And when we went through this and were unable to find any link between Borna virus and this, uh, and this syndrome, the one thing that did impress me was that there was an enormous amount of immunoreactivity that appeared to be nonspecific in these individuals. So at a time when people were saying this was a psychosomatic disorder, I said two-thirds to three-quarters of the individuals whom we've studied have polyclonal B-cell activation. They're sick. We don't know why, but they're sick. So that's really the take-home point. I mean, I think people are now aware of this. There's going to be a request for these sorts of materials. Two people have already received samples and are beginning to work them up. Uh, so I'm optimistic that we will make headway. Um, and this is going to be a very open application process, and we hope that people all over the world will be interested in using these samples and shedding light on this important syndrome. Now, it, maybe some of my, former, my panelists would like to add something. Frank, would you like to add anything? You've been quite quiet, which is unusual for you. <laughs> well, Ian, you're so eloquent, I don't know <laughs> if I can add anything. I think the important thing to say about the original studies and what's <clears throat> come forward is science is a self-correcting process, as Ian said, and we it demands reproducibility. What the original find, where the original findings were in error is uh, almost difficult, if not impossible, to tell at the moment because that's a historic fact. We can't go back to those samples, those reagents, and whatnot. But the key thing is any finding needs reproducibility, and it failed on that, so we have to move forward. And I should just say that um, Frank's lab and Maureen Hansen's lab went to extraordinary uh, efforts. They cultured um, for several weeks, at, separated by space and time and location, more than 360 samples. Um, Dan Bertolette, um, Carrie Petrosadowski, uh, Maureen's, um, Ying Huang, uh, extraordinary amount of work. They, they cleaned, they, they put new filters in every hood, changed out labs. Um, it, you, you just cannot say how, how much effort went into this study and we are 100% confident in the results. It was an enormous amount of work that was invested here.